In our last lesson, we reviewed the appointment of high priests under the law. There we find that the high priesthood was associated with glory and with beauty. It was associated with consistency and with illumination and with constancy, glorious attributes, thereby introducing us to the thought that God greatly delights in the salvation of people. He greatly delights in the representation of his people before him. The high priest also dealt with the realm of the unseen, away from flesh and blood, hidden away from the sights, visual sights, and the senses of mankind. The high priesthood of Christ focuses on the realm of the unseen, that unseen world where the invisible God not only resides, but from which he ministers everlasting benefits and consolation to the sons of men. In this lesson, we want to review a different kind of high priest. Here we're going to accent the superiority of the high priesthood of Christ. He is of a different order. He's not the same kind of high priest Aaron was, and the benefits which he ministers are far superior to those ministered under the Old or First Covenant. You see, the new covenant is different. It has a different basis, the blood of Christ, rather than the blood of bulls and goats. It has different benefits, spiritual blessings in heavenly places, rather than tangible benefits and physical protection alone. It has a different sanctuary in the tabernacle which the Lord pitched, and not man. It is not ornate with gold and silver, but ornate with the attributes and character of our great God and the joy, righteousness, and peace in the Holy Spirit that characterize the kingdom of God. It has a different sacrifice. It has different incense, the sweet-smelling savor of the sacrifice of Christ, rather than incense beaten small, rising an odor unto the nostrils of our God. It has a different altar and a different veil. It's a different covenant. Therefore, it has a different high priest. Until this difference is seen, and seen with some degree of clarity, involvement in salvation will be limited. Now to be sure, you can understand somewhat of the great salvation of God, delight in your sins forgiven, but somewhere along the line you must understand your great high priest. Some very significant concepts are associated with it, and great benefits flow from it for you. In the high priesthood of Christ, we have the key to the divine basis for participation. Now, the key word here is participation. In Christ, you become a participator, not just a receiver. Let's note, first of all, that the high priesthood of Christ was God's response to a need. There was a need that existed under the old covenant, a need from God's perspective as well as from man. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter and verse 11, the Spirit of God witnesses, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not called after the order of Aaron? Perfection was not achieved under the old order, and that's what God wanted. Now let's think for a moment on what perfection means. Is he speaking about moral perfection? About being brought to a state where you never sin? After all, the word of the Lord tells us that if any man says he has no sin, he's a liar and the truth is not in him. No perfection in this text is not speaking of moral perfection or absolute perfectness in your manner of life. It's speaking of something far transcendent to that, something also that's accessible to you now. Take for a moment a verse in Hebrews, the seventh chapter, and verse 19, along these same lines. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. You see there that the law was deficient in making people perfect, but what we have in Christ, the better hope, the hope which he is administering from heaven as a high priest, does make perfect. Let's define this a little further. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and verse 9, 
which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, which could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience. There's the key. Perfection is speaking of a pure, cleansed conscience. The ancient order of high priests, in which were offered gifts, animal gifts and sacrifices, could not make a person comfortable in God's presence. Somehow, a sense of ill at easeness was over the high priest himself in the presence of God. His conscience was still defiled. He was made more aware of his sin than he was ever made before. It could not perfect the conscience, cleanse it from sin, make a person conscious of their acceptance with God. Further defined in Hebrews the 10th chapter and verse 1, the Spirit delineates this subject. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. I hear you learn that the high priest, as he stepped before God and offered these sacrifices, together with the comers, those that were a coming to God, approaching unto God, when the sacrifice was offered, they became acutely aware of their sin. The fact that they had sinned and come short of the glory of God, that they transgressed the covenants of God. But this was not God's ultimate objective. This was just one of the steps en route to the ultimate objective, the eternal purpose. God wanted to bring man to a point that when man stood before him, his conscience would be free from guilt. To put it in a positive manner, where he would rest assured, God receives me. I am accepted in his sight. I am spotless before him. Now, student, if you can receive this, you will derive much benefit from it. So far as God is concerned, in Christ you are as sinless as Jesus himself. That's how God sees you, because God cannot fellowship with sin. Now the blood of Jesus Christ is able to bring your conscience to that state, where you are not aware of your sin, but aware of the provision for sin when you stand before the presence of God. One of the great texts of Scripture is Hebrews, the ninth chapter, and verse 14. More than just a text, it's a truth that you must take hold of. You must appropriate it for yourself. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The truth of the matter is, you cannot serve God, profitably labor for Him, until you know in your soul your sins have been taken away. Until you know you've been forgiven. The blood of bulls and goats could not do this, nor the sprinkling of the ashes of an heifer. It made no difference how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of rams and she-goats and heifers and bullocks were killed. It could not make the conscience pure before God. People gathered together to remember they had sinned. But bless God, those that are in Christ Jesus, when they remember the vicarious sacrifice of Christ and engage in that grand ordinance that He ordained to be taken in remembrance of Him, they remember their sins have been cleansed, that they've been purged, that they've been remitted. Thus the conscience is purged and cleansed before God. Oh, to be sure, from one point of view, we know we have sinned. We know we have come short to the glory of God. It grieves our heart that we have. But we have this promise based on the ministry of our high priest that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thus, what the law could not do, God has done in Jesus Christ. Now perceive here the divine objective. God's objective through Christ is to have you presented to Him without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Ephesians the fifth chapter 
verses, verse 27. Now that begins now by your faith in the atoning work of Christ. Jesus has put away your sin. <clears throat> now this change in administration, the change of man's acceptance before God, uh, it actually hinged on the ministry of the high priest. The law was only as effective as the high priest's ministry. It is said in Exodus, the 30th chapter, in verse 10, Aaron shall make an atonement. He made it with the blood. Now the effectiveness of that ancient covenant was effective only to the degree that atonement took effect. Only to the degree it cleansed the conscience. We are told in Scripture that it failed to purge the worshipers. The worshippers' conscience was not cleansed. They remembered sin. They did not forget it. They remembered they were sinners. They did not remember they were forgiven. Why? Because the, it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Hebrews 10 and verse 4. The primary deed of the law, the focal point of the activity of the high priest, was the atonement, the provision of sin. And yet it did not cleanse sin. It did not take the consciousness of sin away from people. It did not give them boldness to come to God. Almost without exception, under the old order, people feared and quaked and trembled in the presence of God. Even Moses, the meekest man in all the earth, when he stood on the trembling earth before God, he said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Why? Because sin had not been satisfactorily dealt with. Because sin had not been taken away, blotted out as a thick cloud. From God's viewpoint, therefore, this condition established a need. There was a need, a need in view of His purpose. His purpose was to present you without any flaw before Him. And the law did not accomplish that. You had flaws multitudinous. Not only was God aware of them, you were aware of them. So a need was sought for another law of a high priest. As Hebrews 7 and verse 11 states, What further need was there? that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek. Let's summarize that ancient order of law, 1,500 years of meticulous religious observance. Uh, they did everything the right way. They did it meticulously, frequently, but it didn't cleanse the heart. In other words, there was religious activity without personal cleansing. Now, student, brother or sister of mine in Christ Jesus, it is not comely for a person to live under the administration of Christ Jesus, engaged in meticulous religious activity, but not possessing inward cleansing, not experiencing the peace of God which passes understanding, not knowing in their hearts that there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. This is not comely or proper in this great day of salvation. A need existed for a new kind of high priest that would change that condition, and God has met the need in Jesus Christ our high priest, and there is no need for you to feel condemned before God any longer. Notice that he does not say, that simply another priest was to be given, but the priest of another order, a different order, a different kind of high priest. Jesus Christ is not a priest like Aaron was. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now here's a divine pronouncement. It's found in Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verses five and six. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, as he hath also in another place. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That divine oath was taken in Psalm 110, verse 4, where God said, I had sworn with an oath, and he will not repent, he will not change. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. On one occasion, God swore 
that he would uh, destroy Israel and make of Moses a great nation. But Moses prevailed upon him to show mercy, and he repented, the Scripture says, and changed his mind. On another occasion, he said he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham challenged him and appealed to his merciful and righteous character. He said, if there's several righteous people there, 50, 40, 30, 10, will you spare the city? And God said, I will. He said, I'll, I'll change on this. But here's a subject on which God will not change, on which he will not alter. We, we are living in the age of the last great high priest. There will never be another one. He is sworn with an oath, and he will not repent. Jesus is the man. He's the high priest, the one that represents us before God. He ever lives to make intercession for the saints. A change has been made. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and he is one forever. You notice in the text we just read, it said, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews, the sixth chapter and verse 20, says that Jesus is the forerunner for us entered, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The seventh chapter and verse 17, For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And verse 21, For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Now who is this Melchizedek? Melchizedek appears briefly in Scripture. His sole role is to introduce Jesus. In the history of mankind, there appears this strange and mysterious character. He steps out of nowhere and disappears into nowhere. And his single objective is to prepare us to think properly about our high priest. The account of Melchizedek is found in Genesis, the 14th chapter. And I want to read that, verses 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine... And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hands. And he, that is Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. Now let's draw a few parallels here between Aaron and Jesus. Between Aaron and Melchizedek. Let's see the difference. Aaron was only a priest. He was not a king. Melchizedek was a priest and a king. He not only represented people to God, he had the power and the authority to implement his objectives. A king and a priest. Aaron primarily served God. But Melchizedek served both God and Abraham. He served Abraham bread and wine. Not only did he serve God, Aaron blessed a people that were noted for sin. That ancient Arianic blessing where God, uh, His favor was bestowed upon Israel, upon a sinful, disobedient, gainsaying, stiff-necked people. But Melchizedek blessed a man noted for faith, Abraham. Aaron blessed only the people. He did not bless God. But Melchizedek blessed both Abraham and God. He said, Blessed be God. Aaron held back God's wrath, but he gave no righteousness. Melchizedek was a king of righteousness, one who could dispense, as it were, righteousness. Righteousness and peace. In Hebrews, the seventh chapter, in verse 2, the writer makes a point of this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. There is a divine order there. First righteousness, then peace. In the case of our great high priest, the righteousness and the peace are both of God. Under Aaron, the righteousness was of man. Therefore, the peace of God was not experienced. Something else about the great high priest Melchizedek. 
He abides a priest continually. Everything we know about him, we know during his tenure as a high priest. Hebrews 7, 3, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now the point here is not that Melchizedek was a supernatural being or that he was a pre-incarnation of Christ. Don't miss the point here. The point he is making is that Melchizedek, his parents were not significant. His lineage was not significant. His birth was not significant. And his death was not significant. What was significant was himself. He was a significant one. So it is. With our Lord Jesus Christ, his person is a significant thing. He himself is the point. Uh, Melchizedek's parents, lineage, birth, and death pale into insignificance because what he is doing was the main thing. So it is with our high priest. It's not the office, it's the man. The man Christ Jesus and what he is doing, that is a significant thing. A dramatic departure from the Aaronic priesthood. Now the word of the Lord asked us to consider how great this man Melchizedek was. Hebrews 7 and verse 4, consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham paid a tenth of his spoils. Abraham. We should have much of an appreciation for Abraham. Abraham is called by James in James 2.23, the friend of God. The friend of God that lived close to him and walked with him. He is called in Galatians the third chapter verses 7 through 9. And again in Romans, the fourth chapter and verse 16, the father of us all, his was an epochal faith, the first type of faith of that sort, in which he took a bare commitment by God, and upon it he hung all of his hopes, and he moved out of his homeland not knowing whither he went. He believed the promises of God, leaned implicitly upon God without questioning him, doubting not, firmly persuaded that what God had promised he was able also to do. He's the father of us all, the pioneer of the sort of trust that is prevalent in Christ Jesus. Not only that, but the promises were made to Abraham. Galatians 2.16 says, God made the promises to Abraham and to his seed. He says, not unto seeds as unto many, but as unto thy seed, which is Jesus Christ. Now Abraham, this great man with all the promises, all the global promises, Worldwide promises. The friend of God, the father of us all. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Now that indicates to you how great a man Melchizedek was. We have no record of Abraham paying tithes to anyone else. The lower priesthood, according to Hebrews, the seventh chapter, verse five, was commanded to take tithes. Abraham, because of his uh, perception of the greatness of Melchizedek, paid tithes. He offered tithes to Melchizedek. That, the Holy Spirit says, is a commentary on how great Melchizedek was. He blessed the one that had the promises. Hebrews 7, 6. He whose descent is not counted from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. The priest was noted for blessing. Melchizedek, the priest, was noted for blessing, not for receiving. Now, Jesus is after that order. Stood it. Jesus is not nearly as interested in what you can give him as what he can give you. He is a dispenser of covenantal benefits. He is the grand administrator of spiritual blessings in heavenly places. All the treasures of God are hid with him, but they will not stay with him if you will receive them. He will take of these eternal things and give them to you, for he is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now this is a continuing priesthood. God's objective called for a continual priest. After all, he said to Abraham, his intention was to bless all nations. Galatians 3 verse 8. All people for all time. That's who God wants to bless. So it is said of Jesus Christ, He is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing or because He 
ever lives to make intercession for them. There's his high priestly role. In one person, the Lord Jesus Christ, our high priest, God reaches back to Eden and forward to the harvest of the world. And he says, whosoever will may come upon the basis of this one high priest, whoever lives to make intercession, Whoever lives to administer these covenantal benefits, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a unique covenant and high priest we have. These two orders, the order of Aaron and the order of Melchizedek, the old and the new, are incompatible. A change in the priesthood had to occur. So God obviated and brought to an abrupt termination the high priesthood that involved men in flesh and blood, and he changed the order and brought in an everlasting priest that could administer to all people under all, condition, under all conditions at any time. Makes no difference where you are, whether you're in the bottom or on the top, whether you have things or do not have things. This high priest can minister to you because he ever lives of a different order. He's in a new realm Heaven in the heavens itself he's entered. He's uh, ministering to a new house. Hebrews the third chapter verse 6 says, Whose house are we? If we hold fast our confidence firm to the end, the joy of it. He's ministering good things to come. Hebrews 9 and verse 11, good things to come. If you're in Christ Jesus, the best is up ahead. Jesus is guaranteeing that it will have your name on it that you'll participate in it. He's our great high priest. He's ministering in a greater and more perfect tabernacle, one which the Lord pitched and not man. It doesn't have to be carried about. Instead of the tabernacle being carried, he brings you into the tabernacle. You're the one that's transportable now, not the tabernacle. He lifts you up and makes you sit together with him in heavenly places. Well, a provision has been made for you in our great high priest, I bid you in Jesus' name to avail yourself of him. He's living now for you.